morning, everyone. Uh, today, uh, I'm going to present uh, on the topic of neurosyphilis. My name is Dr. Marina Das, and I welcome you today to my presentation. So uh, I got interested in this topic because uh, we saw a patient, very interesting patient, who came into the clinic with uh, shooting pains in his uh, limbs. And uh, he had been running from pillar to post to uh, identify the cause of this pain. Interestingly, he was recently diagnosed with HIV and uh, gave interesting history of a past uh, syphilis infection in his teens. So you know, we did the examination and we found uh, that uh, he had loss of reflexes in his lower limbs, uh, loss of ankle reflexes and position sense and some sensory loss too. So we sent him for a CSF analysis and we are following up the, on the case. And that's how I got interested in this case. So let's dive into the topic. Uh, today's contents of my presentation would be history of the disease, comorbidities, the course of the disease, clinical picture, management, discussion, and we'll be open to questions. So the history of the disease, as the name signifies, neurosyphilis refers to the infection of the uh, central nervous system, mainly the brain and spinal cord. And uh, it is caused by treponema pallidum, which is a spirochete. And uh, this can occur any time after the initial infection, maybe weeks, months, or days. And uh, briefly talking about the history, I would like to say that neurosyphilis has been uh, very prevalent in the in the 20th century, which is called the pre-antibiotic era. Uh, and there, the neurosyphilis uh, was prevalent in 25 to 35% of syphilis patients, where one third had asymptomatic uh, neurosyphilis, one third of them had Davis dorsalis, and the rest had meningovascular uh, syphilis. So this uh, was incl in, inclined in the pre-antibiotic era, mostly after the post-World War era, and which came to a decline after the advent of penicillin. We saw a decline in the cases until the last two decades where in the last 20 years, it was there was a resurgence with AIDS. Uh, in the last uh, 20 years, there has been 100,000 cases reported to the CDC in the US. So I would like to mention about the outbreak in California and Washington, uh, where there were uh, cases of ocular syphilis in patients uh, with HIV, and many of them turned blind. There was a case series done in 445 patients, 455 patients with HIV and syphilis, and many of them had ocular syphilis. So a significant amount of the infections uh, uh, turned into neurosyphilis. So for the brevity of the presentation, I am uh, concising it to the I'm not talking about the syphilis infection, but rather I'm focusing more on the neurosyphilis part. So uh, what are the comorbidity and the risk factors associated with it? So uh, as we know, the high risk sexual behaviors and uh, homosexual people with men having sex with men and people living with AIDS have more propensity to develop um, neurosyphilis. And this uh, relationship of syphilis with HIV is a bidirectional relationship. Syphilis exacerbates HIV and H HIV, HIV exacerbates syphilis. Uh, basically, syphilis can uh, cause inflammation in the central nervous system and exacerbate as HIV as well as it can cause uh, immunosuppression. HIV can cause immunosuppression, which increases the susceptibility to syphilis. Uh, in immunocompetent individuals, what we see is a uh, uh, syphilitic chancre provides an entry pathway for the HIV in infection. The course of the disease, I would say, begins with CSF inv invasion. When the CSF is invaded by the organism, it uh, transmits to a stage where it is transient and it clears away. That stage is transient meningitis when the meninges are involved. And if the organism fails to clear away and persists, it's called persistent meningitis. 
It then progresses to early disease, which may take weeks, months, or years, and it can progress later uh, to a late disease, which can progress uh, in decades, which takes decades to manifest. So in the early course of the disease, we well, see okay. yeah. asymptomatic meningitis, uh, which is uh, like uh, meningitis. We, we see no symptoms of meningitis, but there is uh, evidence of the organism in the CSF. So basically, at that time, the patient is asymptomatic, but he is uh, able to transmit the infection to other people. So that's kind of dangerous, right? Uh, then we come to the symptomatic meningitis and meningovascular syphilis, which is in the early course, and we'll talk about them in the next slides. Symptomatic meningitis is basically how uh, the normal meningitis uh, manifests. We, it causes headache, confusion, nausea, vomiting, dizziness. It causes neck rigidity, so we can elicit the signs of Brzezinski and uh, Gernick sign. It also involves cranial neuropathies like optic nerve, facial nerve, auditory nerve. Uh, a more significant uh, finding in symptomatic meningitis is the prevalence of ocular syphilis and otosyphilis. So as we talked about it, a lot of uh, uh, HIV people had been uh, seen with ocular syphilis in the past, recent past. So ocular syphilis, how does it manifest? It manifests as uveitis. It, uh, so the diagnosis can be tricky. Uh, any uh, posterior uveitis and pan uveitis mostly, it co also causes interstitial keratitis, dim diminished visual acuity, optic neuropathy, and retinal detachment. So it can cause loss of vision too. Autosyphilis similarly manifests as unilateral and bilateral hearing loss, particularly high frequency hearing loss, along with tinnitus. So uh, the Patients have to be referred to the ophthalmologist and the uh, ENT specialist to further evaluate for the causes and keeping suspicion of neurosyphilis in mind if they have a relevant history. So meningeal vascular syphilis, uh, syphilis is the infection of the meninges and the vessels, as the name suggests. So the infectious arteritis, which affects the subarachnoid space and the vessels around the brain and spinal cord, that is called meningovascular syphilis. The typical presentation will be a young person with acute stroke. So what do we do? We, we, do we put them in the MRI machine? Well, yes, as we work up the stroke, uh, we do an MRI and we can see uh, infarcts. In angiography, we can see focal narrowing, dilatation, and occlusion. Uh, in many cases, RPR or VDRL may be negative in those cases, which makes the diagnosis a bit tricky at that time. But the history of stroke in a recent uh, uh, young person with a history of syphilis might ring some bells. So coming to late course of the disease, it is uh, generally presented as general paralysis of insane. Uh, or general paralysis as it, is, as it is called, and Thebes dorsalis. So general paralysis manifests as dementia, memory loss, psychiatric symptoms. There are personality changes. The person is difficult, has difficulty to speak, as well as he uh, shows some neurological deficits like facial and limb hypotonia. And in some cases, there are there is loss of reflexes. So uh, Tabis dorsalis uh, similarly projects as lancinating pain, which is shooting pain mostly in the limbs. Uh, there is due, uh, due to uh, posterior column involvement, there is loss of reflexes. There is loss of uh, joint sense and position sense, which leads to sensory ataxia. Uh, the involvement of the bladder can lead to incontinence, which can lead to uh, mostly presence as overflow incontinence. Agile Robertson pupil is particularly seen in Tabis dorsalis, but it has been seen with some association in general paralysis of insane too. But mostly it is a significant association with Tabis dorsalis. And lastly, I would say the degenerative neuropathy that occurs with Tabis dorsalis is Charcot's joint, where the joints are degenerated and deformed. 
So here are some pictures of the Tabis dorsalis signs that we see. Uh, the dorsal column signs where we lose the joint and position sense. And uh, when the patient is asked to stand with the eyes closed, he cannot, he falls off. And uh, in the Agile Robertson people is demonstrated by shining a light to the eyes of the patient. And uh, there is no constriction of the pupils. Whereas when you uh, bring an object nearer to it with accommodation, the pupils con constrict. So these are the pictures of chakrut stone joints, destructive arthropathy, and uh, degenerative jo joint disease. You could see how clearly it can affect in late disease. Uh, the late disease usually takes decades, 15, 20, or 30 decades, and uh, the incidences of TBs as has been declining so far. Mostly the with HIV, the asymptomatic and symptomatic meningitis mostly, and meningovascular syphilis, they, they manifest. So how do we diagnose? So diagnosis is a clinical suspicion and CSF analysis is the key. So what do we do? Do we put in a needle in everyone's back and spine once they come uh, for a, a syphilis evaluation? Well, no. The neurosyphilis, um, the CDC says that the guidelines say that you do not do lumbar puncture in patients who do not have neurologic, ocular, or autologic symptoms. So any patient who shows the signs of syphilis, uh, neurosyphilis, specifically neurological involvement, we do a lumbar puncture. Before that, we can do a screening test with non trypanomal tests, the VDRL, RPR, etc., uh, which are not very specific, and they arise, uh, there may arise some false positive results too. So we do the non-triponomal -trip uh, tests, which are very specific. These are the fluorescent antibody absorption test, FTA, BS, and enzyme immunoassay. So uh, basically, if a patient who has show signs of neurosyphilis, we do a LP uh, and we do the CSF triponomal antibody tests for analysis. Alternatively, we can do an MRI also uh, if we suspect meningovascular syphilis. So now coming to the management, how do we manage these cases? As all we all know that there is a miracle drug for syphilis, which is IV penicillin, but the duration is important. We have to give it for 10 to 14 days. And uh, US uh, recommends two to three to four million units IV every four hours uh, by infusion. So what do we do if a penicillin uh, a patient is penicillin sensitive? So do we go for alternatives? Uh, well, no, we desensitize because uh, penicillin has the highest efficacy here. So we desensitize the patient and then we try to give him penicillin. So in some cases when we couldn't desensitize, we can use alternative therapies like ceftriaxone or doxycycline. The duration is important. We again have to give it for 10 to 14 days. And doxycycline we give for 21 to 28 days. And we have to monitor those patients. Uh, how do we know that the person is disease free? We monitor by after three to six months of therapy, uh, we start monitoring for a fourfold or greater decline in the titer of VDRL or RPR. So basically what we do when we start the treatment, we give, uh, we uh, do a lumbar puncture and we uh, see the titer. If it is one is to 32 around and when we, after three months, we look for titers and three, six months, we look for titers. Uh, if they have declined fourfold, like one is to eight, it has become one is to eight or lesser. So uh, in, in these cases, we do a follow-up for six months, every six months till the uh, CSF is free of, uh, the organisms. Uh, we also see uh, lymphocytosis in the CSF, in neurosyphilis, and increasing protein. However, those are non-specific. We can uh, monitor for an important reaction that occurs during uh, spirochetal infections uh, within the 24 hours of the treatment, which is called the jaris herbsheimer reaction, which presents acutely with uh, headache, chills, fevers, myalgias, rashes, etc. And this is generally self-limited and treated with um, supportive therapy. 
Well, coming to the end of the slide, uh, I would say we come to the discussion. I would say this, uh, there's a sufficient stigma relating to the disease. Uh, earlier in the uh, past, uh, there have been many uh, poets, uh, intellectuals, artists like Van Gogh, Keats, uh, even they say Columbus and Shakespeare have been infected by this uh, disease. And uh, they resorted, uh, many people resorted to uh, erratic treatments, which also incurred uh, mercury poisoning in some cases. So today too, these stigmata remain, which de leads to delay in the treatment, uh, delay in follow-up, follow partner notification and wide, wide range screening. So I believe uh, the stigmata needs to be dealt with. Then I think the false positive VDRL and RPR leads to a delay in treatment and detour, tour, which uh, creates an unnecessary uh, delay. We have to uh, devise strategies and effective uh, investigations, which will be uh, dealt in these matters. There are very few alternatives in these uh, uh, syphilis treatment. Uh, the only one major uh, drug is penicillin, and uh, the desensitization process the desensitization process takes very long. So, in patients who are allergic to syphilis, is uh, they are uh, held at bay. There is a delay in treatment, and uh, the infusion is quite long. So it's a long and tedious process and uh, there needs to be better alternatives and more research needs to go there. That is what I feel. And uh, particularly this is important because there have been, there has been a global resurgence of syphilis. Uh, so which has increased from uh, 1990 to 2000, uh, sorry, 20, uh, because uh, after 2000, because they have uh, had so many cases, more than 110,000 uh, cases, which were reported to CDC. So we need to do something about this and we need to have some more research and newer drugs uh, regarding this. There's a study by Melody et al, uh, which points to the unique challenges and diagnosis and treatment. And they also propose a various, uh, of various factors which uh, we can inculcate in our research like uh, prevention and pre-exposure and post-exposure therapies for both HIV and syphilis, uh, which can be a good read too if you want to uh, know more about the topic. So that will it, that is it for today. And thank you for listening to me and I'll be open to questions. Uh, thank you so much. Okay.